Hi, Stacey Henley, The Gamer. Um, I just wanted to ask mainly about the decision to remove Master Chief's helmet. That's been a big topic of, I suppose, excitement for some fans, but also some fans haven't been as uh, willing to embrace that. What was the thought process behind doing that? And how do you think fans will take it once it's out in the wild? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're going to see a range of reactions. Um, you know, I think for some people, this has been 20 years in the making, right? Waiting to see. We, we showed glimpses of the eyes in Halo 4, and, um, you know, we've shown him as a child in, in multiple executions. Um, and then for others, you know, they feel, they feel very protective of the, the mystery of the Master Chief that they have in their head, right? They, they own part of who Master Chief is by virtue of, of playing him as a character. And so, um, you know, it was, it was uh, a hard decision knowing that there were such strong feelings about that. On the other hand, it was also a straightforward decision once we really started to understand the story, knowing that it was always a goal to tell a story about the Master Chief and always a goal to really tell a story about John, which isn't something that we're actually able to do in the games or haven't done in the games. And, and having the, the benefit of this amazing long form storytelling medium in television where we can really do uh, great character development meant it was important for, for the helmet to come off. It was important to see the man inside the armor uh, and really experience his journey um, right, right there in front of you. Jamie. Hi, Jamie Ruby, Sci-Fi Vision. Can you talk about um, striking the balance between bringing storyline from the game and adding in your own spin? Yeah, um, well first we started with, as Kiki said, a story about John and his journey of self-discovery. So we, from that point on, we were sort of committed to telling our own story that existed within the universe that people know of Halo. And it gave us a chance to, to build out worlds, either some new ones or, in many cases, worlds that were canonical, in a way that <clears throat> allowed fans who know the game to really get the chance to visit those places, like the Rubble or Madrigal. And of course, for people initi newly initiated into Halo, a chance to see new worlds for the first time at all. So we didn't consciously run away from retelling stuff from the games. We also realized that why tell you the stuff you've seen in the games when we can tell you a, a story of our own and keep it in that same world um, and expand on the world of it. So um, I think it really just started with the organically with the story of John and then from that point figuring out our themes and you know the themes are everything from what does it mean to be human to how much of, of your own humanity are you willing to risk to save humanity or how much are you willing to risk of humanity to save humanity and so questions of warfare questions of sacrifice come, come in and then in the Halsey story she was just as fascinated with what humanity could be and her own vision of how to preserve it um, and her ideas of what artificial intelligence can do for that and is AI as human as human. And so it just kind of snowballed and took on its own, its own momentum. And to the extent that we could bring in stuff that people would love from the games, we absolutely did. But at the same time, we focused on telling our story. Thank you. Sure. Donovan. Hey, Donovan Erskine, Shack News. I'm curious how involved uh, was 343 Industries in uh, creating the show and just bringing that story to life on screen and yeah. how uh, influential it <laughs> was. Uh, Should I take this one? <laughs> She's like... <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, 34, I mean, my, I started on the show three years ago. They've been developing it for years before I got there. Uh, my first experience on the show was flying up to Seattle to meet with 343 <laughs> to get uh, indoctrinated in the boot camp for what, three, for what Halo is, what its ethos is. So no, it's been uh, it's been three four three's baby all along, and and to the extent that we all as craftspeople and artists in our in our fields get to do our job, we did it always in conjunction and working with as partners with three four three and Kiki. So that, she's like, why won't she go away? <laughs> no, but every every decision, you know, it's like um, you're designing an artifact, you're designing a piece of har hardware, you're just, even a piece of artwork or. A, a tire for civilians that live on reach. Things that you never see in the game, you might read about in a book, but that haven't been established. Everything was gone, had, was, went through 343's uh, collective mind. Um, and again, it was never a sense of, 
looking for the bumpers and the uh, you know the sort of limits. It was more about them empowering us and saying, look at what the Canon has to offer. Go come here first. And when you want to make a change or you want to elaborate, you know, let's have that conversation. And they were very generous in that regard too, where I got to invent new characters that hopefully become now part of the Canon. So yeah, um, yeah it's and they were pretty much involved. Yeah. <laughs> and so much about Halo isn't just, I'm sorry, that cat is so cute. Um, oh. So much about Halo isn't just the the objects in the universe or, or the names of the characters. So much of it is about the feelings and the emotions and what it means to feel like you're part of that that universe and, and, and the themes of Halo. So, you know, these are all amazing creative conversations, not about just the technical details of Halo, although there are many of those. Um, but also just sort of the zeitgeist and what it means to be a Halo story and what it means to feel of the Halo universe. Yeah. Gary. Hello, Gary from Comic-Con.com. You touched upon how uh, creating the series was a collaborative effort, but yet it's non-canonical, so there's a degree of freedom to it. Uh, was there ever a direction that you wanted to take the series where there was some pushback, like serious pushback? Well, first, I wouldn't say it's non-canonical. I'd just say it's it's canon adjacent. It's very much inspired by and and includes most of canon. To the extent that were changes were made, they were made deliberately in conjunction with three four three to serve the story. Um, so there was never a sense of I want to do this, and there was pushback against that. It was more, um, as Kiki said earlier, you. They've given us this world and this ethos and this sort of spirit of what Halo is, and we bought into it. So the story we wanted to tell was in keeping with that. And so then it became more about just asking for deeper questions if we needed to from 343 about canon to make sure we were getting certain stuff right. Um, but we were also given so much freedom to just kind of pursue the stories we want to tell, you know? So there was never a sense of um, real disagreement or conflict about that kind of stuff. Geek? Hi. Um, my question is for Stephen, because uh, because I admired you on what you did for The Last Ship, oh. and because of all the character development and the political intrigue. But I wanted to know was, it, um, because of those experiences on that show, are you bringing a lot a lot of that also into uh, Halo because, uh, you know, for the past 20 years, all I remember is just fighting the Covenant uh, myself, uh, <laughs> you know, playing these video games. Well, first of all, um, we did have a Master Chief on both shows. Uh, on the last ship, we had a Master Chief as well. Um, look, I think what the, that show taught me was uh, how to work with, a, you know, uh, a cannon, because I was working with the U.S. Navy's cannon, you know, trying to honor their their spirit and their ethos of honor, courage, and commitment, and um, and tell those stories. And I think that certainly the knowledge I got from the military perspective helped with the UNSC yeah. and writing that dialogue and knowing how they think and how they talk and walking around set saying, that guy should not be wearing his cover or whatever, those kinds of stuff. Um, but I think that The Last Ship and Halo are similar in the sense that we are building worlds, building worlds that, that feel real even outside the frame. So you feel like it could go on in any, any direction and feel like it's authentic. Um, Halo just was on a scale even even larger, um, but uh, no, I think that uh, the one thing it did let me uh, one advantage I had over everyone else, I think, was when people were muttering about, "I heard the virus is coming to Austria. Do you think it's going to come to Hungary?" I kept saying, "Guys, we're going home. We're, we're shutting down for a couple <laughs> for six months." <laughs> they said it'll be two weeks. I said, I'm, "I'm packing all my bags." So my knowledge of the virus <laughs> gave me a little advantage. Um, I'm sorry that came true. Um, but no, I think that uh, they're very similar in the sense of, of the scale and scope. Um, obviously, Halo is just that much more, more enormous. But um, my feeling is the same as it was on that show, which is, you know, honor the, the spirit of the people and the organization that you're, you're representing on film. Yeah. And the UNSC is very much modeled on modern military and modern Marines. So I think, you know, again, that experience you had with, with the Navy was invaluable. I walked around with my medal from the Secretary of the Navy just I to did. make sure everyone stayed in line. It was line. very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. that.